Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. In this video, we're back looking at the Federal Railroad Administration's high-speed rail corridors. This time we'll look at the Northern New England high-speed rail corridor. This corridor was created by Congress in 2000 to connect Portland, Maine, Boston, Massachusetts, and Montreal in Quebec, Canada, expressly via New Hampshire and Vermont. In 2004, this was extended to connect to Albany, New York, and Hartford, Connecticut, via Springfield, Massachusetts. Thereby, this corridor would potentially connect six U.S. states and one Canadian province. The most populous is New York at 19.6 million people. However, we'll just barely cross the border from Massachusetts to connect to the 1.2 million in Albany. The largest by land area is Quebec, at about 90% of the size of Alaska. The group also includes three of the least populated states in the U.S. Those are Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, each at less than 1.5 million people. In total, this group represents 42.7 million and 24.3 million minus the unserved parts of New York State. These 42.7 million people reside in an area of 720,000 square miles, or roughly 110% of the size of Alaska. Four of these states are among the smallest in the Union at fewer than 11,000 square miles each. That produces a density of 59 people per square mile, which is the least dense we've looked at by a factor of two. However, we're really only dealing with about 2% of Quebec, 3% of New York State, and 15% of Maine. The economic strength per capita of the various states is similar, with Quebec lagging around 35% lower than New York State. This is a multi-branched corridor that can be described as being centered on Boston. Boston is a metro of 4.9 million, the largest in the corridor. The Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority operates light rail, heavy rail, commuter rail, bus and ferry service in the Boston area. MBTA has one of the most significant commuter rail systems in the U.S., and it will be essential to almost any plan in and out of that area. Montreal is the other major metro at 4 million people. Transit in Montreal is provided by Société de Transport de Montréal, or STM. STM provides rubber-tired metro and bus services. Albany at 1.2 million and Hartford also 1.2 million are smaller-sized large metro areas. Albany has local bus services as well as bus rapid transit courtesy of CPTA. Hartford has regular bus and BRT as well as regional rail services through the CT Rail Hartford line. Mid-sized metros are Worcester, Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts, Portland, Maine, and Manchester, New Hampshire, each of which have their own local bus services. Springfield also has access to regional rail via the Hartford line. Most of the corridor is covered by one of several Amtrak rail routes, a connection with Montreal and also between Vermont and the majority of New Hampshire are the exceptions by rail. Amtrak does connect to Montreal, but west of Lake Champlain, and that area is not a part of this corridor. Speaking of Amtrak, the federal government's plan for this corridor is to slowly increment it toward what they consider to be high-speed rail, which is diesel electric with a top speed of 110 miles per hour. In this series, we're leapfrogging that idea and going straight to true high-speed rail, attempting to average between 140 and 160 miles per hour in order to see what that might look like. But before we do that, let's look at the challenges this corridor is facing. Topography. The area around Montreal is flat. The eastern coast of the U.S. is reasonable. The rest is hills, mountains over 4,000 feet high, and narrow river valleys. Environmental and local opposition. 
In New Hampshire and Vermont in particular, you have a lot of lesser spoiled areas that locals aren't going to want ruined by construction. Boston and Montreal. The cores of both metros are packed, making it difficult to get a new right-of-way of any kind in or out. Also, let's look at the high-speed rail guiding principles that helped shape the routes I settled on. Number one, separate passenger and freight rail. This is desirable in order to increase speed and safety. Number two, utilize existing rights-of-way. Property acquisition can be expensive and increase litigation. Current rights-of-way can also provide access to areas where construction of new rights-of-way would be difficult. Number three, straight rights-of-way. Gentle curves and long straights are necessary to build and maintain high speed. Number four, sealed corridors. At grade intersections and potential incursions by pedestrians or vehicles pose safety risks and slow trains down. Number five, avoid viaducts and tunnels. These make already upfront capital intensive projects that much more expensive. Number six, core urban metro area stations. In order to support urban density, it's important for stations to be near it. This can be difficult and expensive for main lines, so branch lines or outlying stations may be necessary alternatives. Number seven, connect directly to other transit systems. This fosters intermodality and helps disperse riders in ways that avoid travel modes which are less compatible with dense environments. Number eight, connect to international airports. Similar to number seven, but providing access to longer distance travel and increasing the utility of a rail line to the metro and the region. And lastly, how could I possibly estimate cost fast enough to produce a video in a week? My super simple cost estimation method. Number one, is the route in existing or new right of way? Number two, what structures are involved? Is it at grade, aerial trench, or in a tunnel? Number three, how does the surrounding area complicate things? Is it urban, suburban, or rural? Number four, how do regional cost variations in engineering, construction, and land acquisition affect the price? Based on 2016 estimates, California high-speed rail should have cost about $88 billion. My method has California high-speed rail at $86.9 billion. Brightline West. The current Brightline West estimate is $12 billion. My method produces a $12.8 billion result. Atlanta to Charlotte. Based on the 2012 Tier 1 estimate for a 220 mile per hour greenfield alternative, inflation yields about $12.5 billion. My method produces an estimate of $14.3 billion. While not exact, this gives me confidence that my algorithm produces reasonable figures when compared to more comprehensive estimates that take much longer. With all of that out of the way for this system of 612 miles, I came up with a cost estimate of $67.8 billion. Most of that cost is in Massachusetts where construction is quite expensive and 37% of the track would be located. This includes 589 miles of mainline and 23 miles of branch line for Worcester, Massachusetts, as we are bypassing it in this video. While we are connecting all of the desired cities in the manner described by Congress, it is likely this would be implemented using existing rail rights of way. However, I used mostly interstate rights of way for my hypothetical system because I judged them to be straighter, faster, and High-speed trains are more able to handle their less stringent grade requirements. The hypothetical system takes as many convenient shortcuts as possible. The system can be described as follows from east to west. Amtrak right-of-way from the current Albany Station to Interstate 90 East, continuing along that route through the Berkshires to Interstate 495 outside of Boston. 
The main line would bypass Worcester with an additional track along CSX and MBTA rights of way, acting as a local branch. At Springfield, the route would branch south from Interstate 90 along existing rail, under downtown Springfield in a three-mile tunnel, and then along Amtrak's existing New Haven-Springfield line to Hartford, Connecticut. Back to Interstate 495, we're going to construct ring rail along this path in an arc extending southeast to Interstate 95 near Mansfield and northeast to Interstate 95 near Amesbury. At Mansfield, the route would travel briefly along Interstate 95 toward Boston, hooking up with the Northeast Corridor and allowing access to Boston South Station. Similarly, Interstate 95 in the north would provide a conduit to Boston North Station using the interstate, a disused rail line, and current MBTA right-of-way. In the other direction, we would follow Interstate 95 through New Hampshire and terminate in downtown Portland, Maine. Also branching off of Interstate 495 would be a line to Montreal, Canada via New Hampshire and Vermont. This would utilize Massachusetts 213 to connect to Interstate 93 near Lawrence. It would continue north on Interstate 93 with a stop in Manchester, New Hampshire, near Manchester Boston Regional Airport, and transition to Interstate 89 at Concord. This would continue through many miles of woodland, narrow river valleys, hills and mountains before stopping at Burlington, Vermont, near the University of Vermont, and Burlington International Airport. The route would continue north along Interstate 89 into Canada, transitioning to the new A35. We would follow A35 to Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, Forgive me if I butcher the French pronunciations, but this is French Canada. Almost all the place names are in French. We would bypass Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu at high speed on new right-of-way before hooking up with local rail. We would cross the St. Lawrence River and crash rudely through a neighborhood before joining Société de Transport de Montréal right-of-way and ultimately ending up at Gare Centrale, which means Central Rail Station in downtown Montreal. In addition to stops named, many regional stops could be added at the discretion of states slash provinces involved. Let's look at some travel times. Albany to Boston South, 194 miles in, 2 hours, 2 minutes, for an average of 95 miles per hour. Portland to Boston North, 106 miles in 50 minutes for an average of 127 miles per hour. Montreal to Boston North, 350 miles in 3 hours 42 minutes for an average of 94 miles per hour. Springfield to Boston South, 111 miles in 1 hour 4 minutes for an average of 104 miles per hour. Burlington, Vermont to Montreal, 97 miles in 59 minutes for an average of 98 miles per hour. Worcester, Massachusetts to Portland, Maine, 146 miles in 1 hour 14 minutes at an average of 118 miles per hour. And Hartford, Connecticut to Manchester, New Hampshire, 153 miles in 1 hour, 25 minutes, at an average of 108 miles per hour. A couple of extra points, I chose Interstate 495 ring rail over a connector between North and South Boston stations because it would cost half as much and provide much better regional connectivity. Number two, I didn't put a station there, but Portsmouth International Airport in Portsmouth, New Hampshire could make a handy secondary airport for the Boston area with this high-speed rail system enabling a connection from Boston North Station in about 40 minutes. For technology, I am assuming tilting trains due to the many curves on the various interstates 
and the few places top speed could be attained outside of Maine. Looking at plausible extensions of this system, as mentioned, this could hook up with the NEC between Boston and Providence. Also, NEC at New Haven is possible with batteries. On the west end, this would meet the Empire Corridor at Albany. All of those combined would create a system like this. What do you think of this corridor aimed at true high speed? Is it too slow through the mountainous areas? Would you choose Interstate 495 Ring Rail, a Boston North-South connector, or both? It's interesting to consider the possibilities of high-speed rail in the United States, even if the ideas currently seem fanciful. However, we will continue to do just that with more Federal Railroad Administration high-speed rail corridor videos. Up next will be the Pacific Northwest Corridor, between Eugene, Oregon and Vancouver, British Columbia. Also more of your favorite channel series coming your way and watch out for a visualizing Brightline West video coming soon. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.